Go start, you know, even now. Uh, so that's, then it is called, it is a translation from February month. And one was a Vaidhi. Dandi was a Vaidhi. And he believed in uh, God. And so he begins his work with an invocation to God. Whereas Kaviraj Marga, written by a Jain, they don't believe in God. King is God for them. King is more important. So it begins with an invocation to the King. That is a certain very interesting thing to find in the text. Now let me reflect what it is to write in my language today. When I was a student in England in between 63 and 66, I have said it before, but I will repeat it. I saw a film by uh, Seven C with Malcolm Bradbury, who was my guide, who was himself a writer. And then I remember to have told him, because I saw it without any subtitles, I told Malcolm, look Malcolm, for a European to get an idea of the Middle Ages, you have to go to a library and study. But for me, the Middle Ages is in me, in my mother, in my grandmother. We live in all times, so we live in a coexistence of centuries. That's the term I use. And then he said, then your literature should also reflect it. That coexistence of different ages within one's own consciousness. So I may have a conflict within me because there is a middle age speaking in me and a modern time speaking in me. It's true of almost every Indian, that conflict within oneself. It is there in the family also. You may have read Kamu, but you will get married according to the wishes of your grandmother in your own subcaste. <laughs> I have it all the time. It is important. I have given it. And I created this coexistence of centuries in my novel. And then it created a lot of problems for me when I come back. Because the Brahmins were very angry, they wanted to ban the film and they went to the court. But the film had to be released a day before the court could meet and, and all that. At the same time, one of my teachers there, David Lodge, he a, comes from a very Catholic family. He wrote a novel while I was writing some story, I was writing his novel. His novel was a, an attack on the Pope who allowed birth control only through safe period. So David Dodge wrote, here is a couple who are in love with each other, but they have a calendar and they tick it off in order to make love. What kind of a situation we are in? So David Dodge told me, I thought that my Catholic friends would be very angry with me and they read my novel and said, what a good plot, how good the characters are, what a language. They were aesthetically thrilled by that. Whereas you write a novel, nobody <laughs> bothers whether it is a good novel, aesthetically good or not. They attack you for its content. And David Lutz said, you are luckier than me. People who know the language, you know, may like the language, what you write, you know, say that it's very well written very beautiful. And sometimes it is so condescending to be said that you write good English. Nobody says it to a good writer. So anyhow, that is the strength of writing in a regional language. It creates a certain kind of a movement within the society. It still has that, although the literary, literate people are few, it reaches. There was a time in Karnataka in the 12th century when the literacy rate was much lower than ours. But the Shiva Sharanas came, you know, the great uh, poets who worshipped Shiva, the mystic poets, and they wrote those great vachanas which have been translated by Ramanujan, speaking of Shiva, you know, it's a very wonderful book. Where you have Basava, Allama, Akka, all these people, they wrote vachanas. Look at the word vachana. Vachana is that which is spoken, not that which is written. So it is 
I think they worked through, you know, people came together and then somebody would create a vajan and then speak it up. It would be remembered. There are enough mnemonic devices within the vajan so that you don't forget the vajan. This type copyright can never act with a language like ours. You can just remember if it is written really well and then you can carry it and then leave it over. That happens to the Indian language. I still remember I was in China during the, um, when they had this Tiananmen Square. I saw blood along with other writers and a Urdu scholar, a Chinese Urdu scholar, he was Chinese, came to one of us who was a Urdu scholar and said, I can't write what I want, but I will make a, a little poem in Urdu which can easily be remembered. So go and tell it to others. He made up a poem because Urdu is a language where which works through memory and yes. he said, I don't want to, I can't write in Chinese, so I want to say what I want to say in Urdu. So he preferred Urdu to Chinese. Our languages also have that capacity. A yeah, Malayali poet can stand here and then for half an hour recite a poem without looking at the paper. It's like a Vedic chant. It has that kind of a power. It is there in Hindi, it is there in our, all the Indian languages, which has been lost in the language of the, the international community. It's there, but not of this quality, the language itself can speak. So that is one advantage. And another advantage is this. <clears throat> English is still a living language. I am getting back to a theory that I spoke of. When, when English was exhausted in England, the Americans wrote a new kind of a literature. You read T.S. Lawrence, you know, he was, it was he who first recognized the Americans have a new voice altogether. They have brought it into the English language. Americans did it. The Puritanism and, and all those. And Walt Whitman, for instance, was. Walt Whitman was almost like uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. There is nothing on which he did not speak. Yeah. There is another writer in my language who is like it. That is Purandar Das. There is nothing on which Purandara has not written. He has also written on the problems of a man who has two wives. <laughs> and then he makes it a, a spiritual message. You know. That kind of a, a poet. And then the British had Africa, their backyard. But at the great time, you know, which I study, which I studied a little in English, Yeats and others, it came from Ireland, which was a backyard. Ireland was a backyard of England. It came from England. But our languages have a vast backyard. You know, there are so many published epics, but there are unpublished oral epics in our languages. They are now being written down and then published. And what else? Sanskrit or English or Persian at one time, and we can sit there and talk about highly enlightened things and so on. And if you take uh, the usual village home of a, a rich um, Indian, you know, it has a front yard uh, where people gather, and then it has a middle place, you know, it's dark and cool, and then you go into the kitchen where only the mother can go, even the father can't go when he's not washed. And then after the kitchen, there is a backyard, and there is a well. I imagined this, you know, when I had this metaphor. In the well, you know, my mother goes and brings water. And also, women from other communities also come there. And when women gather, they talk about things, you know, which are not, which are shunned by men. They talk about their menstruation problems, the problems of their husbands, you know, not being loyal to them, to each other. And if a boy doesn't haunt the backyard, he will not become a novelist. You become only a philosopher. <laughs> because you have to listen to these things, you know. There is another life goes on, you know, in the backyard. 
I mean, literally in the backyard. You know, my grandfather could go and then find a medicinal plant in the backyard. And my mother could cook a quick dish for somebody who came in an untimely hour from some leaf in the backyard with a little, you know, current. So backyard is rich. India has a very rich backyard. You know, now with the Dalits, women, and uh, the very backward people getting education, you get more of quality literature in the world. I don't think that English will be served as much as Indian languages will be served by people who are awakening now into new political consciousness, consciousness of their dignity in Tamil land, in, in everywhere. So it's a rich area. And sometimes, you know, the quality may not be very high according to your this, but it has its own quality and you have to determine the quality according to the need that the whole people feel within the language. So that continuously happens in our languages. So one of the reasons why I thought that although I know the English language, I should make it a conscious attempt to keep to my language to write. And then not want translations to be done because if you want translations to be done, you will write only what is translatable. You should never do that. You should never do that. You should write what is difficult to translate. Because English is not in such a rich language in order to make it possible to make our servant women in the backyard <laughs> use that language. There's a lot left out of that language. So you should not make it translatable, but it should be translated into other Indian languages. Probably then, it is possible to have a Tagore kind of figure in every Indian language. Because we are, we are not less than European languages, you know. Many European languages are also like our languages. And hence, there are some words in English which should never be used. I hate the word ethnic. I never use the word ethnic. Because it is used for food and this and that to sell something which is strange. And another is vernacular. If I write in a vernacular, I say Shakespeare wrote in a vernacular, Dante wrote in a vernacular, Milton wrote in a vernacular. That again is a, not the right word. We use the word bhasha to use all the Indian languages. And again, you know, what is the advantage? Another idea that Peter de Souza just mentioned. If that we should have a strong center becomes your desire and if you do the job of Nebrija for the whole country and evolve a grammar and a language that the whole country speaks, forgetting their own languages. I don't use the word dialect because if a dialect has an army, it becomes a language just wait for an army to become a language. So anyhow, if these are all gone and we all speak the same language, which will get you a job easily in an IT or anywhere, anywhere in India, then I think India will be a tasteless, colorless country. But at the same time, my Kaviraj Marga knew, I will evolve a language of my own for my land, but not too much away from Sanskrit. I have to keep some relation with that. So that's the wisdom that the Indian languages have. And hence, we are a democracy because of these languages. Many of these, although there is an attempt to kill them through commercialization and so on, we should not uh, give it up. You know, we should make a plea for it. Because why one of my political aims now, not my age, I am 80 now, is to see someday all children go to a common school. You know, I always say I became a writer because I went to a common school. 
Kalvin, I wore a shirt and not a little piece of cloth on my Brahminika's upper body at home. But I wore a shirt and went to a school. When we went to a school, I sat with other children of other castes and so on. I mingled with them and the street knowledge came to me through them. And I became a writer in my language. But now our children go to very special schools. And they don't mix with each other. And hence I use a, a great metaphor, you know, of Mahabharata. You know, when Sri Krishna was a big king, he had a friend in school called Kuchela. Kuchela was very poor. And his wife said, your friend is such a big king, why don't you go and ask him for some money? So Kuchela goes to him with a little beaten rice in his bag. That's all he had. And Krishna first asks him, what have you brought for me, old friend? He said, nothing. Give me whatever you have. So Krishna eats Avalaki and then Kuchela grows rich. Now Kuchela and Krishna don't go to the same school. They did at that time. And hence Krishna could become glorious and Kuchel could become rich. Now neither glory comes to the rich nor this to the poor. Because we become two different countries. And hence my commitment to writing my language, writing in my language, will extend to this commitment for a common school. I keep writing about it. Where at one time, Sanskrit was necessary for Canada. And now, English is necessary for Canada. And don't take it away. Because even Dandi was used by Kavir Rajmarka, a Sanskrit poet. So we have to use higher Richards, new theories in America everywhere, and enrich ourselves. That's what we did all the time. That is because there is is a term you know, which I always use when I talk about my language or any regional language. I call it a Chirnagini. I got this concept when I was small, you know, we used to have philosophical debates in our village. As a matter of fact, you know, my village, I used to go to a school in the town and come back to my village where there was a Sanskrit school. There used to be debates in Sanskrit there. And we had a magazine um, which we boys every week produce in handwritten. There used to be articles in English, in Sanskrit and Tamil. Three. This was before India became independent. You know, this is the aspiration of India. You know, acquire more languages and so on. We called it Tarangini. I still remember writing in it. And later on, Samskara was born with an article that I wrote in my Tarangini. Well, I will finish that story. I was a Brahmin boy. But I knew, in spite of our, because I used to hunt the backyard, I knew that one of the Brahmins had a love affair with a Dalit woman. And there was plague in our village. And there was plague, all the Dalits, were dead because they were not inactivated. You know, this is how my new consciousness came, you know, when I was a boy. They were not inactivated. But this very pretty woman who I knew had an affair with a, a brand new gentleman, ran away. Then I wrote a story, not wrote a story, but reinvented the charming princess, you know, who is asleep, the prince who is asleep, touched then he makes up. So I wrote that because I didn't want my elders to know that I know. <laughs> so I wrote a metaphorical story. She was touched and so is he of that? Yes. He was touched by no, no. she she went to a long sleep and a prince a prince, charming prince comes and touches her and she makes up. So touch became a very important theme for me. And Gandhi talking about untouchability, fighting it. So these got mixed in my memory. Into all kinds of metaphors and so on. It was a very rich 
happens because Canada, as I told you, is a jirna. It digests, it digested Sanskrit, gets digested here. And that makes it rich. It doesn't matter if it is geographically bound, because even English, when it is well written, is written by people who are of that region, whose real tongue is that. That's what I believe. The others write good English. But good Canada, good English are not enough for creativity. But Canada, when I write, I not only have Kamun Sartre as my contemporaries, I have Pampa, 10th century Pampa as my contemporaries, and Vajanakaras as my contemporaries. A bit of classical literature, so it is a combination of the classical, the modern, and the folklore, the unwritten, the backyard stuff. All the three come into play in several writers, Kambari is one of them, in which the backyard has spoken very vividly in his poetry. So it, there are many examples among my contemporaries. Thank you for listening so patiently for this lecture, which uh, is not written and presented as it should be presented before great people like who are on the stage. And thank you to Krishna.